Thanks everybody for joining us tonight at the Metropolitan New York Library Council to talk about the 2020 census. Um, my name is Greta Byram and I am the co-director of the Digital Equity Lab at the New School. Um, and what we've been working on at the Digital Equity Laboratory is uncovering the dynamics of digital access and safety as they relate to the census. Um, and this focus um, came out of, you know, observing what was happening with the conversation around the 2020 census, you know, understanding the stakes of the conversation, of not the conversation, understanding the stakes of the census, which is up to $900, $900 billion in federal funding, as well as um, districting decisions, representation decisions at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, and so the stakes are really high, and there's been a lot of conversation so far about the possibility of a citizenship question being added to the census, um, which is um, hotly debated in the press, as we all know, um, and is now um, being considered by the Supreme Court. And it looked like, as of yesterday, um, the citizenship question will be included in the census questionnaire. Um, that's according to the political reporters who are talking about this. The other thing that folks have been talking about a lot is misinformation. And so that conversation comes out of observations around what happened in 2010 um, regarding sort of malicious attempts to chill participation in the census. Um, using misinformation to sort of keep people from participating. Um, but, you know, coming from the perspective of digital equity, what we realized at the lab um, is that there's a whole conversation that's not happening. And that's the conversation about the digital transition. This census is the first one that will be held primarily online. And what that means is that 80% of households in the US will receive their first invitation to participate in the census um, by participating online. There will be follow-up efforts to invite those people to participate in other ways, um, as well as visits from enumerators. But um, looking at this from the perspective of digital access, digital literacy, and digital equity, that in itself was really striking to us. <laughs> um, because I think folks that come from the digital equity field understand something um, really critical here, which is that at least a quarter of US households don't have internet at home. So if you have a critical constitutionally mandated government process like the census that's primarily happening online, um, there's a big gap here. And um, we found that um, this conversation wasn't happening in the public. Uh, excuse me. And the first place that we really found that the conversation had traction is with the libraries. <laughs> and so that's not surprising. Um, the fact is that um, folks who work in libraries really understand um, this question around digital access and digital participation. Libraries have been closing this gap for a long time or, or doing their best to close it. Um, and so, you know, we, we thought um, if there's anything that's going to make a difference as far as ensuring that we get an accurate count in 2020, it's going to be the participation of the libraries. Furthermore, because of um, the uncertainty and the mistrust that's introduced by the possibility of a citizenship question, we felt that as trusted civic institutions, library could play a really important part in encouraging participation in 2020. And so based on all of these learnings, um, all of these sort of um, contextual thoughts around census and uh, because of the very enthusiastic and um, diligent participation of um, folks from library professionals from across the state. Uh, basically, we've convened conversations um, to talk about how this could happen. What do libraries need in order to be the sort of primary implementers of census access? Um, and sort of how do we take the time between now and Census Day 2020 to prepare? And so tonight's conversation, um, 
is going to happen in sort of three parts. Um, so the first part is that we'll hear from some library professionals from um, across New York State. So these are not folks from New York City. And um, we're really grateful to them for coming here tonight. Um, and then we'll do a short Q&A after they speak. Um, and that'll be basically just clarifying questions. So, so short clarifying questions. And then we'll, we'll have um, folks representing the three New York City library systems um, also speak and have some clarifying questions after they speak. And then we'll, we'll have the entire panel up here. And um, then we'll have a bit more of an in-depth discussion. Um, if you are watching on the live stream and you have a question, um, you can tweet it at um, the Metropolitan New York Library Council, and that hashtag, or sorry, that um, handle is at M-N-Y-L-C. Again, at M-N-Y-L-C. Um, and we'll be watching that Twitter feed um, for questions from out there in the world. <laughs> um, we want to thank the Metropolitan New York Library Council for um, holding this event tonight. Thank you so much to Davis Anderson for organizing. Um, and we also are going to have a special guest. And um, she will uh, be speaking after our first round of lightning talks. So I'm going to introduce our first panelists. Um, and they'll speak each for a few minutes about what they're working on. So starting down down at the end. Um, we have Lauren Moore, who's the executive director of the Pioneer Library System, which is a cooperative system serving 42 small and rural public libraries in New York's Finger Lakes region. Um, next down the line is Carolyn. Carolyn. <laughs> Sorry, this is the first time I'm meeting these folks <laughs> in person. Carolyn Ashby is the director of the Nassau Library System in Long Island. Um, it's also a cooperative library system, providing shared services to 54 public libraries um, in Nassau County and Long Island. I think next is Grace Riario, who um, has 22 years of experience working in a diverse number of public and college libraries and is currently the deputy director and outreach coordinator at the Ramapo Catskill Library System in Middletown, New York. And right here is... Um, Mary Lou Carolyn, who is a library futurist, a speaker, writer, library director, and endless idea generator for repositioning libraries as community leaders and innovators. And she's currently at the Newburgh Public Library, or Newburgh Free Library. Yeah. So thank you all to our first round of panelists. And um, they'll each speak for a short while. So hold your questions. And again, tweet questions at, at MNYLC. Thanks, Greta. Um, so my, my name is Lauren Moore. I'm the executive director of the Pioneer Library System. As Greta said, it's a rural library system in upstate New York. Um, I also have the honor of serving as a commissioner on the New York State Census Commission. Um, these two experiences are very interesting, and I think one informs the other. Um, it, especially w when we're thinking about the census. The thing that's been most interesting, and I'd, I'll admit most frustrating about this process of beginning to start conversations in communities, beginning to start conversations with stakeholders, um, is that there seems to be a reluctance to acknowledge things that are true. So we know that there are barriers to completing the census. Those barriers are significant. Those barriers include um, a primarily digital environment. Um, those barriers also include suspicion around the process. The barriers also most likely will include a citizenship question, um, which will affect turnout and participation. And has already, whether that, whether that question remains or not, has already poisoned the well when it comes to people's uh, willingness to participate in the system. But what we're finding is that no one wants to acknowledge these barriers. Um, and it's a, it's a problem. Um, so as the commissioner, I have heard literally hours of testimony from community-based organizations. These are representatives of small organizations, large organizations from all across the state. And all of these people are serving vulnerable populations and, and acknowledging these barriers and saying, we want to help. 
um, this is what it's going to take to get, get us over these barriers. Um, and no one's listening to these people. Um, and I go back to my rural region where people aren't really that concerned about this. Um, and I, I realize what I have to do now is I can no longer, I'm no longer worrying about navigating the politics of it. I don't really care what politics are driving someone's decision whether to care about this issue or not. Someone's decision whether to address the barriers or not. Um, instead, I f what I've decided I'm going to be doing locally and what I've taken on as my charge across the state um, is to kind of is is to create a space for the library voice on the issue, which is separate from the federal census bureau's talking points. It's separate from the state's talking points on this issue. Instead, we can be advocates for people who we know are right now going to be excluded by this process. So, how do we do that? We look to our those library values that drive the work that we do all the time. We are advocates for digital equity, and we continue to advocate for digital equity. Um, we are advocates for ethical technology. Um, and as Greta spoke about earlier, talking about what that means and what does it mean? What are the, what are the conditions that we have in our public libraries that, allow people, that will allow people to participate safely in the census? And what conditions do we need to create? And which conditions can we not create? You know, there will be, when you uh, ask someone to participate in a public tech environment, um, we can't guarantee 100% safety and security. So then how do we communicate to those people who maybe are most vulnerable? Um, and then we also play a role in information. So um, I find that when I, I'm just going to be continue to speak about these issues, <laughs> so we continue to provide that unique library perspective that no one else really cares to hear, but we know is true. Um, and that hopefully by continuing to inject this kind of discussion, we are able to legitimize people's concerns. Um, simply ignoring that these barriers exist is not going to make anyone more likely to participate in the census. I think actually we, we are doing a community service by um, acknowledging that people's reluctance to participate in an online environment with something so sensitive as some of, these, some of this information about the census um, uh, acknowledges again that their experiences are real and that, that, that paranoia isn't paranoia, it's actually based in their li real life experiences. Um, and then it gives us an opportunity as a profession and as a community to do the work to mitigate those risks. If we aren't willing to talk about those risks publicly, then we can't take the steps necessary to, make, to mitigate those risks. Um, and then finally, once we, once we do the best we can to create a set of best practices, a best uh, tech environment, then we can do the work of communicating to our community members. This is the kind of environment we can provide for you. Let's talk about this. What does it feel like for you to complete the census here? Um, how do we help you do this? What concerns do you have? What other questions do you have? And how can we help answer them? Um, and I think that by being realistic and by acknowledging um, that people are vulnerable, this process is sensitive, um, then we can um, you know, create an environment where hopefully we can get more people counted in a way that um, I'd feel comfortable with. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. Great. I'm Caroline Ashby. I'm the director of the Nassau Library System on Long Island. Um, our service area includes 1.3 million people, so I offer a nice contrast to what, what Lauren is experiencing in upstate New York. Um, on Long Island, the organization at the local government level around the census activities is really strong. It's been early, it's been often, they're really on top of the ball. Um, both Nassau and Suffolk counties are working together with an umbrella organization called the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. They've organized 12 subcommittees around hard to count populations like immigrants, people of color, senior citizens. Um, and they invited libraries to the table relatively early. So we have representation on nearly all of the subcommittees, um, both in Nassau County and in Suffolk County. And again, they're working together really nicely to identify all of the community-based organizations that work directly with the populations that are most hard to count. So we're at a little bit of an advantage on, on that point. But strikingly absent from this work is a technology committee or a committee around digital equity. Um, and so 
this work, they're doing a lot of it. These meetings are happening three, four, five times a week right now, but nobody is talking about the technology side of things and how this is actually going to be implemented. What they are talking about is outreach, how to find the people that are hard to count, um, and, and messaging, what are the messages that will resonate with the people that are hard to count. And those are obviously really important steps that we need to take, but once you reach that point, the census is gonna happen whether those steps have, have been successful or not, and where are libraries at that point. Um, the library structure on Long Island and in uh, the rest of the state other than and New York pretty much is different than you might expect if you're from the city. So each of the 54 member libraries in Nassau County is completely independent and autonomous. They have their own boards of trustees, their own policies, their own local governments that they're reporting to um, and responsible to. And so when I go to subcommittee meetings to represent libraries, I have to be really clear that I can't commit resources that don't belong to me. At the same time, I have to message everything that I learned at these committee meetings back to these 54 libraries. And so it's a really interesting time um, to be at the table, but not, it's sort of like a hurry up and wait, to sort of collect all the information, share as much as I can with these committees about what libraries might be able to do if we have the appropriate resources, um, and then take that back, back home. At the same time, you have folks on the ground in libraries that are hearing a lot about the census, getting really interested in the digital equity work, and we don't have that scaffolding yet. We don't know what those messages are. We don't know what resources are going to be available. So it's hard to rally the troops when you don't have the strategy yet. Um, but I, I do have to say that we're lucky that we are at least working on a strategy early and, and forcefully. Um, one of my biggest roles on these subcommittees is to just stress that libraries will be that venue. So when it comes time to take the census outside of the home, libraries are going to be the primary venue. It's just obvious. In Nassau County, we had 1.5 million uses of our public internet computers last year. We had 9.6 million visits to our locations. There's no other community-based organization or retail outlet or anything that has those kinds of numbers. It's obvious that we are going to be the place people come. Also, when you think about hard-to-count populations, libraries are serving them very broadly. We're offering ESL classes. We're offering public internet computers to anyone. We're offering digital literacy instruction to anyone. We have Wi-Fi. We're lending devices. So we are that trusted resource for these issues in the community. Um, and it's obvious it's going to fall to us like other government processes have when they move online, like tax forms. I'm sure everybody that works in a library has been hit with a lot of folks the last couple of months wanting to know what the library is going to do to help them because there's nowhere else to turn right now. Um, same thing with Medicare enrollment, et cetera. And so these things fall to libraries and, and Right now, pretty much all it seems we can do is talk about it because there are so many unknowns. So the state budget included t up to 20 million for census-related work that libraries might have access to. We don't know yet what the application is go going to be like to, to access these resources, um, what sorts of activities in, in particular they will support. And again, the, the information that's coming from the Census Bureau is also not entirely consistent so we have partnership partnership specialists on Long Island and when I speak with them sometimes we get a different answer than when the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island speaks with them and so that's been a really big challenge too because in order to make this work in libraries we need to have that training for staff we need to all have the appropriate messaging and the and the right story when we don't know what the census is going to look like or whether we'll have access to paper questionnaires there's not much we can do at this point um, so again, it's good we're at the table, but we don't have all the food we need to eat on the table. <laughs> Long Island has a couple of, of challenges in particular. Affordable housing is one of them. Uh, so is migration. We've got 10,000 unaccompanied children that, that sh showed up in Long Island in the last 10 years um, that are being served by our schools that are not receiving appropriate funding for them. And so with our housing situation, you have multiple families, sometimes 12 families living in a house, and they're only gonna get one census card. So we need to make sure that they're getting the message that the, the census is trusted and safe, but again, we don't know how to tell them that appropriately at this point. Um, I wanna bring up one last point before I turn it over to you, Grace, and that's about what the census data means for libraries, especially in New York State. So 
library systems like the ones that Lauren, myself, and, and Grace work for in particular, our funding is primarily through the state and it's primarily dependent on our population which they count through the census. So in undercount in Nassau County relative to Pioneer service area or Pocatskill service area has real dire impacts for my budget and the way I can serve the member libraries that report to me. So um, it's criti critically important not just for the communities we serve but also for the libraries themselves that the count is as accurate and fair as possible. So in my system, I, I work at the Rama Pocatskill library system. We have four counties that we served and we have some rural li libraries and we have some urban libraries. So we have a little bit of everything, which means that our problems are also diverse when it comes to the census. Uh, we had a different experience. Uh, we have been the voice that has communicated to the nonprofits, to the local county governments, to our legislators that the census is coming and we need to think about how we're going to secure that people get counted how are we going to handle the fact that we have a number of areas in our four counties that have no access to internet? And it has been very interesting to us that they didn't think that is a problem. And they, I've had many people from different counties um, that have said to me, well, people have phones, right? So they can just do it in the phones. Well, they don't understand that that's data and people are paying for data and they're not about to spend some money and doing a form. That's just not going to happen. So trying to talk to them about the impact that having um, a census bureau whose goal is to have 90% of people do something online and the effect that that's going to have, they don't seem to understand the impact of that. They seem to think that the census is going to have enough money to hire people and knock in people's doors. That works fantastic, but if you are in a rural area like Lauren and I live in, we will not be having people knocking in people's doors and having people open their doors. That's just not going to happen. So there's a lot of barriers that we're seeing, but to me is the amazing fact is that a lot of our county local legislators do not seem to think this is a big deal. The nonprofits have been very good partners to us. They have partnered with us in different areas. So we have a very good relationship across the four counties, which is Sullivan, Rockland, Orange, and Ulster counties. We have very good relationship with the nonprofits, and they have been the ones that have actually said, oh, the libraries are coming to us with this, we should listen. And they're partnering with us on developing the complete count committees per county. And they're actually helping us assess what are the hard count to areas and where should we put our resources. The little we have, that's what we need them for. And the grassroots organizations have been phenomenal to us. They are the folks that are coming to the complete count committee table and telling us, have you thought of this, have you thought of that? So they are the folks that are really helping us out. And I have to say, out of the Sullivan County, we're working with the nonprofits to develop the complete count committee. They are working very hard on trying to see what resources we have. The libraries there are usually small and they have very small budgets. So we're trying to figure it out what a strategic plan we can have for them. Um, it does, we, I can't say that we as a system come out with a, a strategic plan that is gonna work for every county because we can't. We have four counties that are very different. They have different needs. So we're trying to strategize by county and trying to figure it out how the libraries can be an asset to the nonprofit organizations and the grassroots organizations that they work with these folks. In Orange County, we have been extremely successful. And I'm, a, I'm Mary Lou is here and she will talk to you about how successful we've been in Orange County. In Rockland County, n success has not been it. We have talked to the county, um, departments, they think they still have time to do this, that, that we have enough time to educate folks, that it's too early yet to, to talk to folks about any barriers that we have. That w So it has been quite um, frustrating, I will say. But the nonprofit organizations are ready to work, and we, our biggest thing that we have done is just educate. Right now we're educating folks about what the impact of the census is. We're trying to um, let fear not be the reason why people don't want to even discuss this, right? Because education 
it's very important for people to understand the impact of this. Even if you're fearful about the question of the citizenship, I understand. But closing one ears and closing one eyes is not going to make any difference. So we're trying to educate folks. That's our primary goal right now. And eventually, we're hoping to have a more strategic plan when it comes to marketing census and seeing what each of our libraries and each of our counties are going to do to help folks. Because the other thing we are also working on at the moment is training our staff at the member libraries, at each of our libraries, so they understand themselves why is it important that people get counted. Because they are the line, the line folks, right? So when somebody comes into the library, the first people they see are the people that are your checkout desk, are your reference desks. So if they don't understand what the importance of the census is, then we're giving the wrong message. So right now, we are educating our people to make sure that they have uh, the information they need and their questions are being answered, right? Because they have questions as well. So that's what we're working currently. We have had quite a bit of success on trying to get folks to talk. And the more we talk, the better it is. So I just want to say that because uh, we have a great complete count committee in Orange County, which has been fabulous, Mary Lou has been an asset to that in Newburgh. And Newburgh, for us, is a hard to count area. Thank you, um, Grace. I, you know, I'm, I'm involved in all of this because, you know, Grace got this started early on and she has really been spearheading this. And um, I am taking up the ball for the Newburgh Free Library and the, the city of Newburgh because we are historically undercounted. Um, we're a very culturally diverse, um, socioeconomically challenged city. And um, at, in the 2010 census, we were at 57% in terms of um, reporting. And that was with print, um, which people think is a little bit easier because they can fill it out and, and send it in. Um, the, the challenge that we also have that's tagged onto this whole digital component of this new census is the fact that in our, um, we're located right in the, um, heart of the city of Newburgh, and in our immediate area, 40 to 60 percent of that area does not have access to computers. So um, we are doubly challenged with that. And once again, the role of the library is critical to this, and it's something that I really embrace, and, and, and we all do as well, that we've, we've always known uh, the importance of, of digital equity um, as far as, uh, uh, you know, our uh, re outreach into the community. And our um, role as a trusted resource is just is critical to us, and I think um, it's we're really uh, going to be challenged with that through this whole process, um, because we have so many issues that we're addressing through this, and it's so critical um, from every standpoint that our communities are counted. So um, by Grace really igniting this issue with us in uh, January on I think one of the coldest days of the winter, thank you for that, um, <laughs> we all gathered at like 7.30 in the morning, um, a big crew of people to, um, to sit down and really talk about this issue. And, and as Grace said, there were so many other organizations beyond libraries that were represented, and that's critical because we are the catalysts to bring the organizations together and we are also going to be the catalyst that I feel very strongly are going to make this census a, a successful effort because we have the passion for it. Um, we uh, joined in uh, back in, in January, not only with the library system, but also with Census 2020. And that has um, the, been an incredible resource for us. They provide a lot of the information. They are um, actively trying to recruit um, for positions uh, to carry out the census. And in um, situations, uh, cities such as Newburgh, it is going to be really critical to the success of the census that the people who are going door to door look like the people who are answering the door. And that will help to address a lot of the trust issues. Um, so, you know, there, there are good paying jobs that are out there. And that's one of our big pushes now is 
um, getting that information out about the employment. Uh, we want to get people hired. It's a process. You're working with the government, so you know it's, it's probably going to take six months for anybody to even get a phone call. So we're just encouraging people to hang in there and um, sign up. We're giving them all of the information. We're sharing that. We are early educators. So while the, the census isn't going to hit the ground or uh, hit the, the computers until next April, this whole time is really critical for the setup. It is all about education. It is, uh, and we are trying to allay the fears through education. We are trying to let people know what this is all about. Um, why are we asking these questions? Um, who's asking the questions? Uh, what, will be, what will this information be for? And so by the time this happens, people will be educated. They will still, of course, have the option to choose to fill out this information or not. But at least they will have the information and hopefully um, get beyond the, the, the fear and the trust issues. Um, but at the very least, be educated about what this is all about. And because we are so underrepresented um, historically, uh, we have so many problems in Newburgh because we simply do not have the funding to repair the roads, to um, you know, fix, fix our downtown areas, to um, provide proper health care. So you know, we are really trying to, to hit these target issues with people so that they understand because they are the recipients of, of um, both the services and the lack of services. And if we can help them to understand the importance of being counted, um, then we will have done due diligence with that. Um, but one of the key, uh, other key issues along with educating the public, of course, is a, as you all have been saying, educating our staff um, and educating the community leaders. I'm really focused on getting all of the people that, that um, are out there as representatives of the community, our, our legislators, local and um, county and state, to understand this as well and be able to articulate the talking points um, so that when they encounter people in the community, they're able to understand what is Title 13 and what, what are the concerns and um, where is this information going and uh, you know, to be able to give out some dollar amounts and, and the, the different avenues that, that those dollars are, are um, directed to. So we have uh, locally joined in with um, uh, New York Civic Engagement Table, which is part of a group locally uh, organized. And we, um, we have formed a, a really cohesive unit. And we are, um, we are boots on the ground. We are Newburgh Counts. And we're going to start with um, uh, posters that, that say Newburgh Counts here and, and work with our businesses our organizations, our, all the residents who want to promote this and start putting this, this signage up, put but, wear buttons, you know, really start this education so that people understand that the message is coming from trusted sources and that we're able to provide them the information that they, that they want so that this is a successful count. Thank you all so much. And um, can we have a round of applause, please, for, uh, for these folks? So thank you all uh, for bringing the perspective of outside of New York City to New York City. <laughs> very much a, a super important perspective and a very important group that I forgot to mention before is the New York Counts 2020 Coalition. Um, I am the co-chair of that um, committee of the, uh, sorry, the Tech and Tools Committee for New York Counts 2020 and it's under their auspices that we started to convene this conversation um, with the libraries. Um, there are other wonderful institutions and folks represented on that committee. And um, we are also now joined by our special guest. Um, <laughs> so um, I uh, wanted to just acknowledge and thank Maya Wiley for her leadership. Um, she is the Senior Vice President for Social Justice at the New School University. Um, and she's also the founder and director of the Digital Equity Laboratory. And it was Maya who, who first um, really raised um, the issue of census to me as a critical um, and absolutely urgent issue in the field of digital equity. So it's her leadership that sort of brought all of this together. Um, and before we dive into Q&A for, for these folks, I'd love it, Maya, if you could come up and just say a few words about why the census is so important um, and this sort of 
meeting place that we're talking about between digital equity and access and census, uh, which is a really new, a new thing for us. So thanks so much, Maya, for being here. Sorry, I was late. Um, I, I actually was co-chairing another meeting, but I, um, I wanted to start with a quote and ask you to tell me who said it. The quote is, New York City and all of our nation's cities have for far too long suffered undercounts that have denied us political representation and federal resources. George Washington? <laughs> uh, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani. In 1996, ahead of the 2000 wow. census. Wow. So nothing's changed, <laughs> except Rudy Giuliani. Um, uh, I, Yes, a lot, but we don't have enough time for that conversation. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to use that quote, one, because I wanted to ground this in the fact that undercounting is a traditional problem for us, right? This is not a new problem, and in fact, in New York City in the 2010, I, I'm, I'm going to speak to New York City because I don't have the statistics for all of the cities uh, or rural areas in the state, um, but New York City alone uh, was so thrilled that we got the mail-in return rate to 57 percent. That was great. That was a historic high, and that was in part from all the things we've been hearing from our panelists, because the city had put so much effort into community-based organizations and partnerships far out in advance of the census to get the mail-in participation rate up to that historic high. So fast forward now <laughs> to that being a far too low percentage overall. And remember in the 2010 census, just to put the stakes on top of this, you know, Rudy Giuliani was complaining about sending back $900 million. Um, we sent back about $1.5 billion a year in this state because of undercounting in federal resources. And, and as we've also heard, when, we, when we're talking about these federal resources, we're not just talking about whether you can see a doctor because you are in Medicaid, whether you get a free lunch at school and whether that free lunch is actually paid for with the federal dollars that are supposed to pay for it, it's even things like how many hospital beds do we need? Uh, how, when we, what kind of population density determines what kind of firefighter presence we need? Now, I don't want to say that these are the only data sources that any community uses to make these kinds of decisions, because that would be wrong. But it's so fundamental to understanding what our resources are, who we are, who we need to serve, and even how we need to serve them. Um, so it's both financial, but it's really much more than financial. Um, but it's also basic democracy. So we lost two congressional seats as a result of the 2010 census. We are projected to lose two more. So even our influence at national level is reduced because we undercount. Um, I, I'm not going to say a lot about the Supreme Court case that just got argued on the citizenship question, uh, except I do want to go back to this point of trust uh, that we've been talking about and really ground it in a context in which we have a federal administration, because it's not just asking about uh, citizenship, right? I mean, meaning you could imagine a scenario in which we were asking that question. In fact, we have asked it periodically, like in the ACS, just small samples right, to try to get at the number. It's not because we, and we asked it in the 1950, in 1950 census was the last time we formally asked a question around where were you born. The point is we're doing it in a context where we have ICE agents showing up 
at places like clinics and courthouses, which in previous administrations were considered sensitive areas because you wanted people to be able to use government services. You wanted people to cooperate with law enforcement uh, if they were victims of a crime. You wanted people to get the health care they needed. So, so there was an agreement. There was actually even a memorandum of understanding. But now that ICE agents are literally showing up, not just, it's not just a theoretical conversation or just a conversation about caging people at the border. They're literally showing up in places they weren't showing up before directly in our communities and in different ways, right? So it really is not a theoretical fear. Um, and then when you add the, so why digital equity? So first of all, I want to say that our approach when we talk about digital equity at the Digital Equity Lab is that digital equity critical components, I won't go through the definition because I'm sure we all share it in terms of all the, comp like having access to the internet, being able to afford it, knowing how to use it, being able to use it safely and have your data collected. But it really is, I, we, we really include in the definition of digital equity what social good it drives. So it's not just having the tools, it's what it drives. And the census, this conversation around census really is digital equity in that definitional sense. Because this is the example. It's no longer techno technology just as a tool, right? It's really about all the fundamental ways in which technology is now excluding, excluding people from basic ability to participate democratically, to be understood, to develop community, to share needs and solve problems. And it's why libraries were such an obvious partner. Such an obvious partner. Because libraries aren't just places for digital learning, although they are critical places for digital learning. They aren't just places where people can take courses or get online. They're actually trusted. Librarians are trusted. And libraries, as poorly funded as they are, and they're far too underfunded, as far too limited as their capacity is, are fundamental to the very communities that are undercounted. So if we can figure out how to support libraries to do what libraries already do so effectively, we're not just getting to a place where we're getting people more safely counted, but actually helping them be much more active members of society. And that ultimately is what the census represents at a practical level. But I think this builds much more, not that the census isn't enough, because it's already a disaster uh, right now. We could, I could talk about all the horrific stories around why it's a disaster, but I don't want to depress you. <laughs> um, because we know, and we had students uh, who, in our digital equity laboratory course, who worked with um, a, a library in an underserved community. Uh, and it was just so exciting and palpably important, both for the librarians and for the community, to figure out this partnership to get this done. But also, it creates a new level of partnership around digital equity much more broadly. And I, I do think we want to hold that, too. Because I think if we have our way, <laughs> and I intend to have my way, um, we will have not just a better census count, we will have strengthened the digital equity and community and social capital fabric of our rural areas, our cities, of all our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, so um, this has been an exciting deep dive and then pull back and big picture. <laughs> um, but highlighting, you know, what Maya said is, how do we get this done? <laughs> um, we're going to get it done. And the libraries are going to be critical to that. Um, but you know, what, what you all have highlighted for us is really the nitty gritty of how. <laughs> um, and so with that in mind, you know, this is the critical question about implementation, right? Um, what are your questions for these folks? Yeah. I have like a hundred questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just to start by saying that I am in the midst of building a pilot in New Jersey in Passaic County where the mayor ran on the fact that the city had been undercounted and was going to fix it. Uh, 
that is an early childhood program because as you guys probably know, uh, two million children, zero to four, were under yeah. mm -hmm. It's mostly low income, yeah. diverse yeah. populations. So I, we have been actually doing. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. So I've been diving deep into this, and uh, we're actually a, a publishing company for low-income families. So we're doing a children's book called We Count that is for ages zero to four that also has information, like it's pictures of families, and then it explains how you would count that family. Like Maya lives in a house with 15 people, some of whom she knows, some of whom, you get the point. Anyway, so I've been looking at tools because it seemed I've been working with Head Starts, pre-K, uh, pediatricians offices, reach out and read, every program and trying to find tools and now I'm talking to the ALA. So my very first question, I'm sorry, I just have, I'll only ask two, how's that? Then I'll just bother you Okay, but you they have to have question marks at the end. So they will. Okay, yeah, okay. so my first question is, is, is the ALA or a national organization helping each of the libraries at all with training, with event planning, with any kind of tools? That was a question. So I do believe the American Library Association, they have a website with resources. Um, but, uh, but that's about it. It's more about outreach and advocacy and kind of like, hey, if you need to complete the census, go to your local library. But there's no resources, uh, there's no funding, there's no right. coordinated effort. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm looking to is um, the Digital Equity Laboratory will be releasing a risk assessment. Um, and that risk assessment is a very practical guide for all organizations, but I think it works specifically for, works especially well for libraries and allows you to do an analysis of the technology in your library and what vulnerabilities might exist and how you improve them. Um, and in New York, one of the things that's really interesting is that we have this system structure for libraries. So that actually once some sort of best practices are developed, then it is quite practical to implement them across a wide region. So if I'm able to look at these best practices, then I can, in a pretty, it, I, I can build the scale to make sure that my 42 libraries benefit from that. You know, that might not happen completely equally across all 42 libraries, but I can do a pretty good job of making sure that that information gets deep down into that library network. Um, and the systems in New York all talk to each other, so we can actually coordinate from, a, from we can use one tool and with just a minimal amount of resources, but there are some resources required. That's the thing that we lack right now. There, we need a little something to make mm -hmm. this happen, mm -hmm. um, but with just a, a modest investment, we can really um, launch one single initiative across the entire network of more than 750 public libraries in New York. Okay, how about one, one more person can answer that one, and then we've got a question over there. And again, these are sort of clarifying questions, and we'll have uh, more time for discussion later. So please. I guess I would just add real quick that I think for hard to count populations, the local, the local aspect of it is really important. It's census tract by census tract, and the messaging and the strategy is going to be different. So I, I don't know, honestly, what ALA can do at this point. Great. Okay. Um, can you pass the mic down, and and we'll come back to your other question, hopefully. Good evening. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, I'm Mark Fogg, and I'm working with the New York Counts 2020 coalition and some of their organizing efforts as they um, begin to move into more of an operational mode working across the state. Um, Lauren, just a quick follow-up question to what you said about um, the fact that some resources would be needed and not all libraries in your system would, might be able to um, meet that need. Have, have you or any of the other systems thought about um, uh, sort of designating certain libraries within the system as places that could get upgrades and, and sort of triaging in a, in a sense. This way, you know, at least some of them, uh, hopefully spread out evenly, kind of reach a minimum level of, uh, of capacity and, and safety. Yeah, that's something we're talking about, um, especially so in a rural region, there isn't much, there really isn't much capacity. Um, I was, I was looking to this, to the Long Island model, and there, there's an organization that received funding that is doing great work of coordinating people. People are attributing effort in kind also, but there is this, this, this scaffolding that exists. Um, in a rural region like ours, there 
isn't. So, again, so that's actually something we've been talking about. How do we prioritize with limited resources? So first we have to see what kind of resources appear. Um, and it's very possible that we don't get any additional resources. So then what, with what we do have, then it probably is a matter of designating certain sites as census sites. Um, but I think that also works as part of the communication to organizations too, those grassroots organizations. I think rather than, I, the, one of the things that makes me cringe is the idea of people just walking around with their iPads, like knocking on doors or hanging out at the grocery store. Um, that just sets up a situation where people's data isn't protected. You're not really actually doing that work of helping to inform people. I think the best model is for communities to kind of get, okay, what are the designated census sites? Ideally, that would be a couple libraries in each county. And you know that if you send someone there, there are people that are trained, there's a technology infrastructure in place, um, and, and that so we can all invest our resources in those locations. And I really do believe that libraries, I know in my region, libraries are the, are, are the ideal spot for that, I, I believe. That's so actually something that we're, we are committed to doing as being sort of that model um, for the other libraries to uh, try to emulate um, we're we're setting up separate sites in our um, in our facility that will be um, private areas where people can complete the census, and um, our staff will be trained to work with people. Um, we will be identified as a as a trusted site, um, but that is something that we're trying to create that model within um, the Newburgh Library as as the central library for RCLS, and then pass that along to the other libraries in the system that this is what's working or this is how, how we recommend setting it up and then training people to, to then uh, do that in their particular facilities as well. So um, I think that we're gonna um, move on, but um, move on to the next piece of the agenda for the evening, but I wanna thank all of you so much for um, speaking on behalf of your patrons and your systems. Thank you so much. Um, let's have a round of applause for our non-New York City folks. Um, and I want to just emphasize that we, um, we need to think about this on a statewide level. Um, this is not something that can really be split into city and state. This is, this is an issue that um, involves all of us and in which you know, we really have to make um, a collective effort statewide in order for this to work. So thank you all so much for traveling. Um, so next, what we're gonna do is um, move into a discussion about New York City's public library systems. Um, and so Jesse and Anita and Jeff, if you guys could come up and I'm gonna introduce you all. Um, and you know, as we uh, move into this, this phase of the evening, um, I just want to um, acknowledge that, that thus far we've really talked about libraries as trusted institutions, the importance of that trust, libraries as efficient implementers, um, the kind of efficiency um, of scale that libraries have, um, libraries as uh, uh, institutions that can unify and clarify messaging, and so let's hold all of those things in mind as we move forward because um, we'll have some time to discuss that later. But um, right now I wanna turn to um, the representatives of our New York City systems. So down on the end, we have Anita Favretto. Um, Anita is the Associate Director of Outreach Services and Adult Programming for New York Public Library. So she sets strategic direction, builds programming partnerships, and provides support and training to programming and outreach staff across a network of 88 neighborhood libraries in New York City. So that's the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island, right? Yep. Great. Um, next on the line, we have Jeff Lambert um, with Queens Public Library. He's a librarian and technology integrator interested in how libraries serve as community hubs for lifelong learning. Um, and he's the Digital Literacy Coordinator at Queens Public Library. And finally, right here is Jesse Montero, um, who has worked at Brooklyn Public Library since 2005, and he is Brooklyn Public Library's Central Library Director, um, and so we're just super glad that all of you could be here with us tonight, and we're looking forward to hearing about um, your planning effort for the 2020 Census. 
Um, so let's let's start again um, down there with sure. Anita, if you're ready. Okay. Yeah. You. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone, and and thank you for welcoming us tonight. It's really good to see so much um, interest in the census um, for the New York New York Public Library. We really started thinking about this um, probably almost a year ago now. Um, when we first seriously started considering the needs of our, our communities and the library's role in supporting the census count. Um, the library has always had a role in supporting the census. We know that, uh, but mostly as a provider of information to our patrons and our communities. This time round, with the added complexity of an online form, so the digital equity question, um, the question about citizenship status and a general wariness of the federal government and the potential for abusing information, um, collected through the census, we know that our role um, requires something else this time around. So we've been thinking really deeply about what that means. Um, New, the New York Public Library covers the Bronx, Manhattan and Staten Island. So we have 88 branches and we cover three large complex boroughs. Um, within these boroughs, um, there are some of the most undercounted neighbourhoods uh, from the 2010 census. And so whilst the demographics in many of these neighbourhoods we know have changed over the last 10 years or so, the digital divide and the language and the cultural barriers are still really real. Um, and we've talked a lot about the digital divide, but I think the language and the cultural barriers are as significant and important um, and require a, a response from us. Um, we decided that our approach would be first to get a better understanding of priorities. So with 88 branches, we knew we would need to have an approach that was catering to different, the needs of different communities. Um, we conducted a, a needs assessment of the neighbourhoods by looking at the underreported areas from the last census. And we know that things have changed, so this isn't an accurate predictor of where the undercounts will necessarily be this time round, but it was a starting point for us in starting to understand the potential impact of an undercount on our, on our um, communities. Um, we also overlaid that data with data on internet connectivity and the digital access data. Um, so we know there are certain neighbourhoods where there is uh, limited access, low access to um, internet. Um, we overlaid that data with the census undercount data to start to get a sense also of where we might predict um, undercounts. At the most basic level, we know that we want people to be able to walk into any of our branches and access information about the census and also have access to a free computer and an internet service in order to complete their census. Um, to do that, we will be sh we want to make sure that all of our librarians and, and frontline staff are trained to answer basic questions about the census. So things like why the census is, the census is important and what the impact of an undercount will be. So, um, you know, lack of federal representation and the possible loss of two seats, we've already talked, will have um, a really significant impact on this city and state. Um, and in terms of resourcing, um, there is an estimated $3,000 loss in our budget per uncounted individual. So that adds up pretty quickly. Um, knowing how to navigate the census form itself is also something that we will be ensuring that our staff are really confident about, but getting the messaging right will be critical and thinking about how to best shape that messaging depending on the needs of different communities will be, is, is also something that we're focused on. Um, we wanna make sure that we have enough technology available and that's really key as well. So um, making sure, it's really hard to predict what will happen on April 1st. We don't know if there will be a rush of people coming into libraries and we hope through a lot of our outreach there will be a lot of interest and they will come in on that day um, and for the weeks following. Um, but it's really hard to anticipate what the actual demand will be. So we know we need to be very flexible in terms of how we uh, provide support around that. Um, partnership building also is key. And you know we all know that libraries um, are really expert at building community partnerships. Um, that's something we continue to do, but are doing with an eye on the census and thinking about how we can connect with communities to get messages out. Um, through our community partnerships, but also get the message out that the library is available as a safe space to complete their census form. Our, that's, that's the basic level, the basic offering, but we, we have an ideal and we're not quite there yet. We have a plan, but we don't have the resourcing, but we, what we really 
are working towards is identifying um, branches within our, our network that we can really focus our attention on. So really think about how we can provide additional language support, additional programming support as well um, for those communities where we anticipate there might be an undercount and thinking about how we can also uh, create a more concentrated effort around um, community engagement. Um, additional tech, so thinking about um, Chromebooks, um, which I think are probably um, more ideal than a desktop, but I don't know much about the technology, that's just what I've heard. Um, but we're, we're thinking through the technological needs and obviously drawing on advice from um, a lot of other organisations, including the, the Census 2020 Tech and Tools Committee. Um, and we're also working with our colleagues in Queens and Brooklyn, so um, I think what I ought to do now is hand over to Jeff to talk a little bit about Queens Library. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, as Anita mentioned, we're working really closely as the three library systems that serve New York. And with Queens Public Library, we serve about 2.3 million people at 65 locations across uh, the world's borough of Queens. Uh, and we're thinking, you know, as, as everyone has said tonight, about readying our IT infrastructure, working with partners in community-based organizations and city government, and doing what we can right now to upskill our staff around all of the issues that the census uh, raises. Um, and I want to echo Lauren's point about sort of a library values framework here, which I thought was great, that how can we use the census as an opportunity to leverage our open access to IT infrastructure, um, our community reach? You know, the American Library Association came out with stats about how I think 99% or 90% of Americans live within a mile of a public library, so natural partner for census work, right? Um, and lastly, our role as a trusted source of information to really ensure a fair and accurate count in 2020. But we're concerned, as others have mentioned, both about some of the privacy issues that Census 2020 raises, especially being a digital decennial response, and some of the funding issues or lack of funding issues. Um, so New York City is, is a pretty interesting place to work. Uh, we're home to, in 2017, 3.1 million immigrants. Um, about 500,000 of those are undocumented. and. Um, one million New Yorkers live in mixed status households where at least one resident is, um, is an undocumented immigrant. Uh, and a million of those 3.1 live in Queens. Um, so just about half of our service population at Queens Public Library is an immigrant. Um, so how can we reach those households, especially if they're not already library users? How can we work with our community-based partners or deepen existing partnerships to make sure that we're connecting with folks? Um, and if the plan ultimately is to funnel New Yorkers to libraries as a safe and secure access point, how can we connect to community members um, and ensure that we actually are a safe and secure access point? And I want to dig in here a little bit. There was a, a Pew report that came out two years ago about how uh, libraries and librarians are among the most trusted sources of information in a community. Like, uh, I think. 10 times as trusted as social media and about twice as trusted as your local news or your, uh, your national news. Um, so is this, are we running a risk here of sort of expanding our, our trust capital or spending it if we can't ensure that this information is going to be safe and securely stored um, at some data center in Arlington, right? Um, and we all know about Title 13, and we can educate our colleagues about Title 13 so that they can uh, talk to customers or talk to patrons about that. But uh, context matters here, as Maya said, and um, we're in a pretty unique context right now. It's a pretty unique landscape to be working in. Um, so a couple of things that we're doing right now at Queens. Um, we're thinking about access. We had 2.9 million public computer sessions in 2018 and about 480,000 wireless sessions, so clear, clear preference there for our public access terminals. And we're doing an assessment of where we might need to ramp up and should be, depending on funding, uh, think about more of a hub and spoke model where we're, we are doing that triage idea of directing people to you know, 10 or 20 or 30 of our 65 branches to complete uh, response. 
Um, we're thinking about informed communities and information literacy. Um, and this is something we've been working on. Uh, this is where most of our staff training has come to, um, come to the fore at this point. So we've heard about New York counts. We've heard about we count. Uh, at Queens Public Library, we have data counts, uh, which is a uh, staff training initiative and community training initiative that we're, uh, we started piloting this spring. Um, it's really about leveraging or positioning the library in the open data ecosystem of New York City. So in New York, we have a great open data law. The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics maintains a huge resource of data sets from a number of different city agencies, including the libraries. Um, but the, the census is one of the greatest you know, open data resources available to, to our patrons. So data counts is really about engaging with hard to count communities and hard to count census tracts in Queens through a data literacy lens. So can we build up within our community members and within community-based partners um, an understanding of how census data is collected, stored, and how it's utilized uh, by communities to advocate to get at um, hard to count communities in a, a way that's different than just talking about fundraising, talking about um, all those federal dollars that we may or may not get, and about those city, those um, congressional seats that we might lose. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that during the Q&A, but that's where a lot of our efforts have come right now. Uh, in July and August, we're going to be working with our Complete Counts Commission, with the Borough President's Office in Queens, to work with um, just about 100 community uh, members of community-based organizations to run these data literacy workshops um, so that they can bring that information over to their, their patrons and their clients. And here's Jesse. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I get to speak last, so a lot of the uh, points that I might have made have been taken, but we at Brooklyn Public Library are taking the census very seriously. We are waiting in many cases to find what facts emerge about what questions are going to be on the census, what questions are going to be optional or mandatory in an online form. So developing the correct messaging is a little bit of a tricky proposition because we don't want um, the messaging to get out before the facts. So. What we're trying to do right now is basically prepare a sense of urgency among staff and among patrons that the 2020 census is coming, that it will be challenging, that it will be different, and that it'll be very hard to count in Brooklyn. Because in Brooklyn, we have the distinction of being the county, Kings County, of over 500,000 with the lowest response rate in the 2010 census, which is embarrassing, but not especially surprising because we are a borough with many people that are not citizens, we are a borough where about two-thirds of our residents are renters. Uh, we have the largest population in the city of people under five, the largest population of seniors. Um, about a quarter to one-third of our residents don't have internet access. Um, about one in four live in poverty. These are all indicators of being hard to count. Um, so trying to basically get the word out, get the sense of urgency out is what we're doing right now. Um, as far as addressing the challenge, a lot of the things that have been mentioned before, um, making a case for more funding for more technology is going to be an important part of this. Uh, I think not only is the technology itself important, but the technology policies that surround it are also important because hard to count people are also hard to apply for library card people. There's not always um, the ability to provide proof of identification, uh, proof of residency that are typically barriers to getting a library card. $3 for a day pass can be prohibitive for a lot of people that we may want to fill out our census. So looking at the policies that um, set up that technology framework uh, are, th are also things that we want to look at. Um, but we know we have some assets here. I think a th thing that's much different from 10 years ago is that suddenly I think the whole ecosystem understands that libraries are going to be a part and part of this equation. Um, so we have other organizations and city agencies coming to us and just sort of instantly understanding Libraries are a part of how we're going to get to a complete count. Um, so that's a very gratifying thing, but we're hoping that that, um, that understanding is met with additional funds and other resources that are going to help us be successful in that. Um, but we look to our footprint across the borough. We're in every neighborhood, uh, so we have relations in those neighborhoods. Uh, the trust that we talked about before is clearly going to be an important part of this. Um, so we are... Um, 
essentially just preparing it, uh, and when we do have the right uh, set of facts, there will be messaging that emerges from that. Um, and really, it's also just actively looking, like I said, for the funding so that we can be in a position uh, where we can augment uh, the resources we need to do this right. Um, in the near term, I think in the spring, um, we're hoping to host some of those recruitment events. These census jobs are actually, I think there are going to be fewer of these enumerators out there, but they are good paying jobs, and we want to make sure that these people come from the community. Um, uh, as was said earlier, it's very important that uh, the people that are working for this census look like the people that they're knocking on the doors of, they speak the languages of the people that are looking at the doors from, and I think the best pace for an organization like the Census Bureau to connect with those uh, potential recruits are in places like libraries. So I'm really hoping we can um, host some more of those recruiting events. Hosting training events might be a little bit heavier lift given all of our other um, uses for our meeting rooms, but we want to be involved, and right now it's about trying to develop those relationships. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, really a lot of what everyone else has said has been uh, what we've been thinking about and it's really encouraging to hear that there's all this uh, dedication and thought going into it. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thanks to all of you from our New York City systems. Let's have a round of applause for these folks. All right, so now, um, I think let's go ahead and move, given our time constraints, um, let's go ahead and move to a discussion, um, a general discussion. Um, and anybody who has clarifying questions for New York City folks can ask them in this uh, portion of the discussion. Um, but I'd like to ask um, Lauren and Caroline and Mary Lou and Grace to please come on back up. And we are going to have like the wall of sound <laughs> panel. <laughs> So get ready. <laughs> um, the answers are going to be really loud and compelling. Um, <laughs> so while everybody gets situated, I just want to check in with Davis. Um, do we have any questions on the from our audience at home? Not just yet. Okay, folks, on watching the live stream again, you can tweet at at m n y l c. And um, is there any other way for folks to reach us if they're not on Twitter? Uh, the folks, I, I know that's fine. The folks on the live stream have the chat as well that are monitoring. Okay, so there's also a chat on the live stream window. So if you have a question and you're not on Twitter, please feel free to put them in the chat window on live stream. All right, so welcome, wall of library sound. <laughs> um, so I want to kick it off. Um, with a with a question for all of you, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Um, so, I would like to know. We've heard from all of you that there's uncertainty around information, critical information that you need in order to play this implementation role that you're being asked to play. Um, and so, I would like to just ask each one of you to, to crystallize that into, like if you had one information request, what's the number one thing that you feel like you don't know yet, that you need to know? Okay, so I'm gonna let you all think about that. While I just say that from our perspective, um, from the Digital Equity Lab, one of the things that we've identified as a key piece of information that is missing for us is any information on UX or user experience user design, what is it going to look like? It's going to be really hard to prepare people to participate in a digital process when we don't know yet what that interface looks like, feels like, where are people going to get stuck. Um, so from our perspective, that's it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and ask if anybody's ready for that number one piece of critical information that you need right now to make this work. Anybody ready? I would have said the same thing, but in, in the interest of not repeating you, I would like to see what that first mailing looks like with the card with the access code on it. I want to be able to publicize to people what that is going to look like. I want to have posters of it made to put up in libraries. I want our staff to know what font it's going to be in um, so that everybody recognizes it when it comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's critical because people need to go from that to actually going on a computer and ty typing something in, right? So they have to go from a piece of paper to a computer. And if folks who work with new users, 
Um, people who are unfamiliar with digital technology know that that step is really important and that's going to be the kind of thing that library staff are going to need to help with. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that try, that's dri are driving me bananas is when we talk about the fact, you know, digital uh, practitioners will talk about, oh, people don't have internet access at home. They come to libraries and they still struggle. Um, and people from the Census Bureau will say, oh, don't worry about that. We're sending paper forms to those people. But okay, how, how are you targeting that 20% that will get paper? If it's uh, based on FCC maps, which are based on where there's potentially access, but maybe people are not subscribing because they can't afford it, those are the people we're talking about. So um, who's getting the paper form um, and who is not getting the paper form is something that I think we need to know really soon because it will help um, with the outreach and preparation activities. Mm -hmm. So that magical formula of, of that 20% that gets paper first, who, who are those people? Um, so that libraries know um, on the other side um, who's expected to fill it out digitally first. Um, and I think, um, you know, adding to that is, um, you know, understanding also who's who's phone dependent, right? And and what's the expectation there for participation? What does the phone UX look like? Um, and you know, we we know that there's an expectation that you know, if p folks can't pr uh, participate digitally, they should be able to participate by paper. But we also know that paper is dramatically more expensive. So what does that mean in terms of being able to reach the same scale? Um, great. Anybody else ready? Uh, uh, yeah. oh. I'm sorry. No, you go. <laughs> um, Wall of sound. Mm, yes. Uh, so for me, it's more about the, the outreach and just understanding how it will be messaged and how hard to count and hard to reach communities um, will be reached. So there is a strategic plan somewhere being formulated. Um, I'd, I'd love to know more of the details so that we can start working out our own plans so that we're adding value to it and not just you know throwing outreach out into a void. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, for me, is the citizen question. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if it's going to be in it 100% or it's not going to be in it 100% and what exactly the question is going to be because there's a lot of different samples that are online that we are not sure if that's how it's, is it going to be a question that just says are you an, an American citizen, yes or no? Or is it a question, you're an American citizen, and how are you an American citizen? Are you born? Are you naturalized? Do you have a green card? Or you are not here? So I would like to have a, a real factual assurance that that question is going to be here and how is it going to look like? Because I think it will help us uh, talk to people and especially the grassroots uh, folks that work with these communities to secure some type of message, right? Because right now, nobody really knows for sure if it's going to be there or not. Yeah, and then flowing from there is, um, if it is on there, can people skip it? And if they do skip it, um, does that mean they'll get an enumerator visit? Um, does it mean that they will be, um, you know, targeted for additional follow-up? What's, you know, what does, there's a lot of, once we know about the citizenship question, that actually opens up a whole nother set of questions. So, yeah. Okay, great. I, I just want to echo um, Anita's concern for strategy because we are all, you know, we're, we're very conscientious in library world. You know, we're like, yeah, we can handle this. All right. You know, this is, this is what we need to do. Okay, we got it. And, and we start, you know, we hit the ground running. We start organizing. We have people, you know, who get us going. And, and um, we start getting all the key players in place, but you know some of the key players that aren't in place. Is, you know, is like you say, the information about the actual document and what is the the government's focus on this? And you know, are we heading in the right direction with a lot of this stuff? I mean, we're working with a Census 2020 specialist, um, but he's pretty much setting the the foundation for us and giving us some of the paperwork and the you know, the um, information about jobs and all of that, but the nitty gritty of the how to and once April comes, what do we do? You know, what are we ready to do what we're supposed to do on April 1st of 20, uh, whatever, 2020? <laughs> yeah, it's 20, it's re coming really fast. Yeah, I thought it was already here. I thought this was 20. <laughs> Feels that way sometimes. Uh, we've, we've lived like 90 years in the last year, so. Um, Jesse or Jeff? Yeah, I think um, 
as I'm starting to think through what the FAQs are for staff so that they can deliver that information to our patrons in Queens, a lot of it has to do, especially from a technology angle, about um, what happens to their information once it leaves the library. You know, ideally our staff can tell them uh, until the people want to walk out the door about how secure our, our networks are or encrypted or what have you. Um, but what happens once we stop being the stewards of that information? It's kind of a similar conversation that uh, for folks in library land that you might already be having with patrons around, um, you know, vendor agreements or something like that. I can tell you all about how um, we safeguard your, your information and your borrowing history, but um, do I know what 3M does or do I know what Overdrive does? Um, and if I'm a public services frontline librarian, I might not, right? I might not be privy to some of those vendor agreements. Yeah, so, absolutely. Similar with the census. Mm -hmm. um, I think the UX issue is huge. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is what sort of translation tools, if any, are going to be available. Um, I think they're only intending to do it in English and Spanish. I hope I'm wrong about that. Um, but what, you know, what other third party tools might be used um, in a very multilingual borough like Brooklyn? It's just a very practical question that we're going to come up against uh, in those person-to-person uh, -person encounters, and, and that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Yeah, I think um, language access is really key. It's something we've heard about from libraries and community-based organizations as a key concern. I do think that the automated voice response system is going to be available in many languages. How many? 17. The, so. Okay, <laughs> um, but um, you know, I think that that outreach um, language uh, language access for outreach is is a big issue, and um, additionally, um, assisted access for people with disabilities is is a really key issue. That um, you know, these are the things that libraries work on every day, um, and so folks are familiar with these issues. But I think there's not an answer about the scaling up that needs to happen. I mean, happen. I just want to make a comment about the disability because uh, we have, we work very closely with one of our partners in the census. And when we talk to him about how they're going to handle folks that have some type of disability, there's no answer. So I don't think they have even thought about that. And I think they're counting on libraries to have to help those folks because we already do it, right? We already do this work. So they are just expecting us to open our doors and be able to help those folks. So. Yeah, and I think for anybody who's not a library professional who's watching from home, um, one thing that I've learned by hanging out with librarians is the degree to which um, libraries are expected to close a lot of these gaps in our social safety net and how that is already a burden um, that you know they are happy to step up and fill, and I love that about librarians too, but um, there really aren't the resources already that are needed um, to make sure that this happens. And then when you add to it the sheer scale of having every household in the U.S. participate in a process, um, you know, there's, there's, clearly, um, there's clearly something that's not matching up here. There's one more thing I wanted to say um, before I open it up, and that is um, I know of at least one case from Lauren's library system where somebody did receive um, a malicious mailer that was... Um, you know, purporting to be an invitation to participate in census. Um, so, um, Caroline, to your point, having a, a, you know, a model of what the mailer would look like at this point even sounds like it's necessary. Um, so, has anybody else um, seen something like this happen yet? And that, that's one of my, my fears, is we, we repeatedly said how we are a trusted organization. The community trusts us, librarians are trusted, and now we're partnering with government entities and whoever else might get involved with this, and we're, we're, we're really intimately involved in this process. Are we risking that reputation of being the trusted entity? That's, that's one of my fears. Yeah. Um, things go wrong. <laughs> if things go wrong. So I think that is something for us to hold and really think about um, because it seems like another critical thing that's called for is a, a response plan. Um, so um, 
I think Jeff mentioned, or Jesse, somebody mentioned that the Digital Equity Lab, no, it was Anita, um, is we're creating a, um, Lauren, an outward facing, public facing report. We've commissioned a risk assessment, um, a holistic community based risk, dis risk assessment to understand um, some of the risks that, that could happen with the census, including the risk of not being counted, um, everything from that to um, digital and data management risks. So that'll be available around mid May, um, and it'll you know, contain some information to the degree that we've been able to compile it on, on how to address some of these issues. So we'll, you know, we'll notify Metro and, and hopefully they can keep you guys up to date on that. All right, so I'd like to open this up, um, please. And actually, let's just wait till you have a mic. Hi, I'm wondering if there's any effort to educate the public on scams that could arise out of this because there are a lot of people out there getting information and misusing it. When I was a young girl, I was getting a census phone call, which I answered. When we'd have my parents admonish me, they could be getting information from anywhere, using it for anything, especially, and especially now, is there any way to educate the public on when not to answer these questions and, by, and to whom they should not allow information to be given, especially when they come to the house or call? Thank you. Yeah, well, the internet, you know, there's no scams on the internet, so that should be fine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the Census Bureau does um, point out that their system is HTTPS encrypted, and so that means if you are on the Census Bureau's portal, and um, it is the correct portal, and it's absolutely the right portal, <laughs> um, that your all of your data should be protected in transit on its way to the Census Bureau servers. So I just want to point out that that level of protection is there. Um, but can you guys speak to other misinformation or scams that, that you're concerned about or that you've heard about and how to educate people? One of the ones that I know the census is very worried about is their tax, right? Each census person that is going to be knocking in your doors is going to have a name tag that has a digital uh, piece in there. I know they're very worried that people are going to be copying those um, name tags, I guess, and try to make believe that they come from the census. So they're very worried about that, and I know they're doing something about it, but how successful it's going to be, I'm not sure. I mean, I suspect any staff training effort is going to involve some, F, you know, some acknowledgement that they're this is an area that's really rife for misinformation and hoaxes and how to identify some of the common ones, just like there is for um, you know, voter suppression, mis suppression misinformation. I, I think that's gotta be an important part of any staff training. I don't think we know all the facts again to start training for what that is yet, but it should be a part of it. So thank you for bringing that up. I think this is a huge issue, especially for senior populations. On, on Long Island, our local governments have been doing training over the last few years, encouraging seniors not to give out information over the phone or over the internet, not to answer the door when somebody knocks on the door to prevent scams like this. And now they have to slightly revise that messaging to say, unless it's the census. Um, and so I think we're really concerned about the potential for an undercount, especially in the senior population, because we've been sending messaging for years saying, don't do anything like this. And that's a really important point too, because actually seniors have a you typically have a very have a higher self response rate. So now we've added this this hurdle that might make it harder for that population to participate. Um, I, I really that's why I really do favor the model where for that outreach to heart to count populations, it's directing them, it's funneling them to a library, and you go to that library, and there is a, a designated device that only opens up that single correct website. Um, it's, you know, it may seem, that may seem like going through extra hoops, but there's just a lot at stake. And I feel like if you're someone who feels that risk or feels concerned, then that is a way that we help contain that risk for you, so. Great, I think we have a question right here. Hi, um, thanks so much for um, all of your efforts and, and information and um, really 
Great. I'm Catherine Kramer, and I've been working for four years with the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, which is up at Columbia, on an initiative called Data Science for All, which is about data literacy. And it's some of the issues have uh, kind of touched on this, and Jeffrey, I know you're doing great work in Queens about this, but I'm wondering if, on top of all of these other very um, urgent challenges, whether there's any way of um, any of you are seeing this as an opportunity for data literacy um, kind of programming or workshops or both internally, you know, for staff and or for um, the public, right? That, you know, regardless of what's happening or how anybody feels about the census, you know, it's all about data, obviously. It's an enormous data set and how it's used, you know, it, is that something that you're, I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding, but yeah, so it'd be, gr and it'd be great to hear if there are specific things. Again, Jeffrey, I know you're doing, running a lot of workshops, which are great, but just wondering if this is something other of the libraries have picked one, up One on. connection that I'd love to see more of, and perhaps this is an opportunity to get this started, is actually tapping into those communities who use data, who rely on data, who value data, um, to be advocates for communities. Because if, if we continue to, if we want to have good data to use moving forward, it, it, it actually depends on getting these other populations counted. So I think that's one connection that I'd love to see being made, and I'd love to see these voices who sometimes have a little more prestige, a little more connection, a little more resources, like have them take the lead on some of this adv advocacy. So it's not just the grassroots and community-based organizations, but it's these other institutions that are now looking at this connection between using data and also protecting individuals. Anybody want to shout out Library Digital Safety? New York City? <laughs> I, I, I was actually... <laughs> Well, we just started doing what you just suggested with the staff at our member libraries because they, we thought that they were not educated on what's going on online. And we invited Metro to come and do a little training for us. And actually, Davis was at our system last week, and she's going to be there in May because we're very concerned about that. We want to make sure that our folks are educated about what's going on in the internet. So thank you, Davis. <laughs> Um, and just in terms of New York City Library, I think there's a huge opportunity there for us to be doing more of this sort of programming. Um, but we're also thinking about how we build on the programming that we develop for the census, because before we know it, it'll be the 2020 election, and digital literacy is something that we really want to be educating our communities on and making sure that there are plenty of opportunities to tap into um, information that is reliable and also be developing skills. I mean, a lot of what we talk about is really grim with the census, but I think there's also opportunities to just talk about how important the census is in a on a historical basis. Um, so for example, we have Ancestry Library Edition on our computers, and a lot of the content is that is from embargoed censuses going back about 70 years. So you can see the 1940 census and, and backwards, and I think that's actually an interesting opportunity to show people what a census can do to inform uh, posterity, and it's an, it's an opportunity to drive people towards some of our genealogy databases. Um, you know, we have old government documents in, my, uh, in the central library that we can, uh, you know, disinter and bring up and show people, because it really is an important document historically. So while we're being very serious, I think justifiably, with all the uh, aspects of the census, I think there are also opportunities to shed light on our resources and our collections and other things in the programming space. Um, I actually, if, if you don't mind, I'll pass the mic back to you. Yeah, no problem. This is Davis. I wanted to just um, get, have, we have a question in our chat. So I wanted to share that with you all. Uh, Dancing Librarian asks, what information, brochures, or data sources already exist that librarians can use to educate local stakeholders? For instance, a source of where our area have in internet access available and available affordably. That was a little botched. Sorry about that. So I think, thank you for this opportunity. I was going to, meant to point this out and I forgot to. Um, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance on their website, if you click on what we do, then there's a drop down menu and you can click on household internet maps. And actually it's a, gr it's a fantastic tool. So you can dig in deep by the census track and look at what um, broadband adoption rates are like by the census track. Um, 
and it's based on American Community Survey data, which is a bit more reliable, I think, than some of the, they call them 470 maps, which are based on FCC data. So that's a great tool. There's also the hard to count maps, um, which were created by CUNY mapping. Um, one of the issues that I have with that is actually it doesn't, it's a heat map. So when you look at it, there's red areas that are based on who is predicted to be hard to, hardest to count, but it does not include that digital element, which just, it feels like it has to be there. So when you look at a lot of upstate New York, it looks like, oh, no problem, they're fine. Um, I think it actually uh, maybe does a disservice to upstate New York a bit, and probably there are other pockets in the city as well that, that are impacted by that. Share that with Steve? Yes. Oh, I just had a really quick follow-up question because I was just watching the Skip Gates. All he does is to use all the genealogy from the census. And I also had the same thought, which is this is an exciting play way to be counted in history. But I was wondering, they're embargoed? Do you, how does that work? I was wondering, how, do, how are we able to see that and then not be able to see that connected information. So we're able to see up to the 1940 census uh -huh. because the idea is that everyone who is living at that address is you know, passed on, right? Uh, so data is anonymized within, um, as, as a public resource, but then you can see the census rolls after a certain point. So you can go on American Fact Finder right now and learn all about your community and how many people have computers at home and what their water bill is each month, but as you get more granular and as you zoom in to like the census tract level, you're gonna not be able to see certain data points. Um, but you can look at 1940 and see, you know, what your grandfather did for a living or something like that. I think that's an incredible Yeah, absolutely. So we have folded um, some census 2020 conversations into genealogy workshops that we're doing right now at Queens Public Library, I think to great success. And to your point, like, this is an opportunity to be counted. It's a great sort of civic engagement uh, opportunity for, for our patrons in Queens, and especially in, in Queens, I think, for folks that are, are naturalizing or have gone through that process, like all those things that um, a uh, uh, natural born citizen might take for granted, they can be really um, important milestones in someone's life if they've, if they've immigrated to this country. Um, so th for, for folks at home or folks here, I think thinking about opportunities to start census conversations in places that you might not normally have them, like it doesn't need to be a census program, it can be your ancestry.com class, it can be uh, your online privacy class where you're learning about how to detect scams, right? We can be talking about census scams as something to look out for next year. So we can be bringing this into the script in a lot of different places. Yeah, thank right. you. And I just, uh, if you don't have a mic, then the live stream folks can't hear you. So, no, that's fine. It's, it's great. I think, like, this discussion of the way that um, the library is interacting with census can open the door to, you know, positive and interesting, you know, sort of explorations of what, what the census is um, beyond just this, like, data collection mechanism. Because we talk a lot about that $900 billion, and we talk a lot about districting and representation, but these are stories, right? These are stories of people's lives. And I think, you know, um, people should learn about Title 13. And Title 13 is the provision in the US code that um, ensures that census data is confidential and private, right? And that's a very strict law that um, the Census Bureau adheres to. So, you know, people should learn about why that's in place and how the Japanese internment camps were uh, developed using census data. Um, so, you know, all of these stories are really important to know and to remember, and we can open the door to those learnings as well. Um, but I think, you know, it's self-reinforcing, right? The census is one of those things where the data that's captured then begins to um, shape the way that the next decision making is done. So this census is going to sit with us for the next 10 years. Um, and so how do we understand ourselves through this process? Um, it goes, it, it's, 
critically important for functional reasons, but it's critically important for other reasons as well. Um, okay, is there one more burning question? Be okay, great. Over here, before we are going to close it out, and I want everybody to have a chance to, um, you know, just talk about what you feel like is the most important takeaway for people to understand about your preparation and, and where you are with this process. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have the unique uh, life experience of having undocumented parents. Uh, they lived in Queens. I then worked for the census before I was beca became a librarian. I'm actually the head of reference in Patchogue Benford, which is in Suffolk County. Um, and so part of my life experience is if your libraries don't offer anything for your patrons or for your community, there's not a lot of reasons as to why they're going to come into the library in the first place. So a lot of what I've been hearing and a lot of what we're talking about in Patchogue and in Suffolk County is you're, having, you're talking a lot about the strategy of having people come into your libraries, but what are you doing about going out into your communities to talk about your, your library services and also uh, the census as well? Outreach is critical. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of constantly having people come into the library. I feel like we are a library without walls no matter where we are in, in the, um, you know, staff people going out to meetings and um, having our programming held off site and, and being able to build that reputation out in the community um, is, is really critical, as you say. I mean, and the focus shouldn't always be to, to come in. I think with our focus here, it's to, to be that safe place to complete census data. But, um, but part of what the effort that we're working on um, is linking and collaborating with local organizations and actual members of the community who are actively involved in this. And we meet at various places all over um, the area so that um, we are in the neighborhoods where we're having these meetings so that people, again, feel comfortable because you know, you see the open door. Come on in. You know, this is uh, a meeting about the census, and you're seeing your your neighbors in there. So it's been a very neighborhood-focused effort. Um, but you're absolutely right. We really have to be conscious of that. So I totally, totally echo that. Um, outreach is essential, and it's important for us to recognize also that the census doesn't mean what it necessarily means to you and me, to everyone in our communities, um, particularly to immigrants who come from another country where the census might be done completely differently um, or may not be done at all or does not have the same weight um, placed upon it and the same implications. So it's really important to think about um, building those community relationships through outreach as well and thinking about who it is um, it can most benefit from our outreach and, and taking the library to them and it's it's work that we we do every day um, but are thinking about it in terms of the census more and more one more outreach thing I would um, would echo there is getting involved with a complete counts commission commission or committee um, regionally or locally uh, is a great way for libraries to sort of build new partnerships or cement existing ones um, and to step outside the library and uh, really uh, yeah, get out there into the community with your municipal government or with community-based organizations to be, to be building the, f the groundwork here. Uh, yeah, Lauren, and then we're going to have one last round. Yeah, um, there's a really interesting report about the Providence, Rhode Island test that was specifically looking at participation by Hispanic communities um, in the Providence test. Um, one of the things that that study found was that um, passive outreach wasn't effective. So kiosks set up around the community, a kiosk in the post office or grocery store, I think fewer than 100 people in the entire city used, used that tool. So um, that's an interesting lesson, I think, which is that that outreach um, has to be, has to address all of the reasons why someone might not just, if they got that postcard at home, why they didn't just fill it out at home. There's lots of reasons, so that outreach has to be high touch, it has to be focused, has to be targeted, it has to be you know block by block different kinds of strategies. Um, whether libraries are going to be that organization providing that block to block 
um, contact. Without resources, I don't really think that's super practical. Um, I do think, though, that we can help provide some best practices for any of those organizations that would be doing that. Um, or perhaps, again, just finding ways to use that, those deep networks to, to, help, to help bring people to that safe infrastructure or that place where they can get that one-on-one -on -one um, high touch experience. Hey, this is this is how you use a mouse. This is how you go. This is how you find the right website. That sort of thing. So I think it's complicated. I don't think it's as simple as going, you know, being out in a block and saying, "Hey, come come complete the census." But you're absolutely right. We can't just stay within our walls and expect people to come to us. It's going to be a community-wide effort. All right. So um, before we turn it over to one last round. Um, which I want you guys to think about this, which is um, at the Digital Equity Laboratory, we work with a group called Our Data Bodies, and one of the things that they like to talk about is power, not paranoia. <laughs> so there's, there's plenty of opportunity to be paranoid about a lot of things around technology. <laughs> um, but you know, w what do you feel um, brings you power or um, can bring your patrons and your, your neighbors power in this process? Um, so that's my question. That's going to be my, my closing question to all of you. But I just want to also acknowledge that we live in an era in which um, our relationship with government is really complicated. <laughs> um, it's really hard to know sort of who to trust. Our society is really divided. Um, and we're at this critical juncture where we have to decide how we're going to tell ourselves the story of who we are and how that information will be used to then um, create society, create you know how we make decisions about ourselves. Um, so this is a really critical moment. And um, I want to thank you all um, and all the library professionals who are working so hard because um, for me, the answer to the question of where do I feel power, not paranoia, is that I, I feel it in all of you and your dedication and your work and your genuine care for the communities that you work with. So thank you all. Um, and now I'm going to ask you all to respond to that question. Well, I think knowledge is power. And I think this effort, if it's handled well, can give a voice to um, the voiceless and the folks who feel underrepresented, who are underrepresented, um, and it's a it's an enormous effort on our part, um, but it's an effort of passion, and I think it's a great way to enliven our communities and build communities and strengthen communities through this effort. I think the power that libraries bring to the table is unified in people. We do a great job of partnering with a lot of different groups, organizations across very different areas. And I think we are the organization that unifies those folks. And that's the reason we have power. I wouldn't tell anyone to not feel paranoid about any of this. But I also think that paranoia is a self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways. And I think the paranoia is what people are expecting in order to drive intimidation, to drive undercount, to create these feedback loops where we'll have next, less political representation over the next 10 years. And then it just furthers the, um, the political ends of a lot of people that are putting these questions out there. Um, so I, I think that's part of the, the, the thought here, too. There are risks to participating, but there are risks to not participating as well. And I think that's an important thing to understand. Yeah, it's, it's complicated, right? <laughs> uh, we are the data, right? We're, we're the people on each line there, but it's our data as well. It's um, our voice. It's part of our uh, civic representation and um, part of our democratic process. So um, I think we can use this as an opportunity to deepen information literacy and data literacy in the communities that we serve to really cement our partnerships with uh, local organizations and community government and do the best that we can uh, to deliver on that trusted status that we have in our communities. Yeah, and I guess I just agree with all of that. This is going to happen no matter what. So we need to be prepared and help prepare our communities. Part of that means being really well informed, but also making sure that people are feeling connected in an, and in a safe space. And that's something that libraries 
do really well. One thing we're talking about on Long Island is messaging around why I count, so flipping it and, and having people come front and center and, and talking about why they are inspired to take the census and are inspired to um, advocate for everybody else taking the census too. And it's a way for these, for hard to count populations which, which tend to be unseen in other ways as well to try to organize together and come forward together. And so I'm, um, I'm really excited for, to be part of that process. I think all this makes me super stoked to be a librarian. Um, I think it's so, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's really empowering to think that this is, a, this is so, such a complicated issue, but when I think about the values that drive my work as a library and drive the profession, then those values provide um, a pretty clear path forward. So I don't think that we as, an, as a profession have to spend too much time dithering about how to do this. That's why we take action and why we start thinking and why we're not afraid to prepare and why we're not afraid to t tackle those tough issues. It's because we have these values that drive every single one of us. Um, so it's been, I don't know, I just love being able to tap into those values, to be able to talk to those values and really being able to find opportunities to put those values into practice. Um, and that's just a great, great thing about this job. All right, excellent closer. So please join me in thanking our wall of panel. Thank you all so much for being here.